What happens when a high priestess of Satan tries to seduce a man and encounters a power that causes all hell to break loose? Next, on this edition of It's Supernatural. Life after death experiences and angelic communications are on the increase. Terminally ill patients whom doctors have given no hope are unexplainably cured. People are being mysteriously protected from natural disasters. Sid Roth, your investigative reporter, examines this invisible world on It's Supernatural. Hello, I'm Sid Roth, your investigative reporter. My guest was a high priestess of Satan. Most people think that this is just cartoons. Uh, a, a figment of someone's imagination. I mean, the devil is, is someone with a red suit and, and, and a tail and horns, and, and Flip Wilson says, uh, the devil made me do it. Uh, but it's real. Lisa Gwynn, how did you originally get into Satanism? Um, my motivation was I, I was raised in a, a very abusive home environment, uh, a victim at a very young age. And that victimization will often make you look for power, for control, for ways to not become a victim anymore. You know, I remember at a very young age going, I will never be hurt like this again, and trying to find ways to assure that. And the enemy is very, you know, he's very capable. Uh, satanic worship, the occult, witchcraft, ESP, all have a draw of power on them that so, was so very very so appealing you, to me. You had an abusive stepfather mm -hmm. that you wanted to get the edge on, so to speak. Right. But, but how does, how does a, a young child, I mean, how does a young child get into Satanism? There are a lot of different factors. For me, um, I can tell you that media played a big role. I remember growing up, one of my favorite songs was about a woman um, who had the title of a witch in the song and she could hold men spellbound by the look in her eyes, you know, uh, to sing along with those words and to dream of having that much power over our abusers. You know, I had a friend who was also in an abusive situation. We kind of bonded together just to get each other through, you know. Um, two of our favorite shows were about a witch and a genie, television shows, and young, impressionable kids in situations of being hurt and abused all the time. Do you know what a, what a draw it was to watch these shows and to wish that all we had to do was twitch our nose or blink our eyes. Did you believe that when away. you were watching it? You will believe anything. When you are in a situation where you're being violated, driven down, torn apart and shredded emotionally, you'll grasp to any hope in any port in the storm. You know? And in desperation, you'll, be, you'll begin to believe whatever you can. With us, we went to our, just our school libraries. Lots of books on ESP increasing your ESP ability. Lots of books on witchcraft, you know? Our school libraries are full of books on the occult. But, but you had an uncle that helped you on. Yes, I had an uncle related by marriage um, who was the only adult for a long time that listened to me, that, that um, seemed to respect me. We would sit and have long talks because as I began studying about the supernatural and the occult and, and ESP and things of that sort, he would encourage me in those studies, and I had no idea he was a satanic priest. And so he was pretty much grooming me to, to be incorporated into that lifestyle. Did, in other words, you didn't know that he was a satanic priest? Would it have bothered you if you knew it? Probably not. I probably would have found it very appealing, okay. and so, more than likely. So did you reach a point where this power stopped your stepfather from abusing you? Yes, I remember him coming toward me once, and I stood there and I visualized. Um, by, th by the time this happened, I had these lovely little imaginary friends, uh, people that, that I could only see, you know how kids have imaginary mm -hmm. friends. But my imaginary friends, I believed were so powerful. Uh, actually, what, what it was was spiritual forces that I've, I had put myself into agreement, you know, contract with that put an aura and a power around me that when he came toward me and I was like, no way. And he literally backed away looking like this. How old were you at that time? I was 13. 
took all that time, and I was already a Satanist at that time. I was initiated at age 12. Now, most of what I know about that is you see on television, but uh, that's not even the tip of the iceberg. Um, how bad is Satanism? It's very prevalent. You have to understand Satanism is not just active worshiping of, of Satan. Satanism is any religion or practice that, that fosters man's belief in himself and his separation and independence from a higher power, from God, you know, as we understand him to be. No, but I, I read about sacrificing children. Is this, is this for real? That's for real. If you let your imagination run wild with you, a lot of what you believe and picture about Satanism is real. The problem comes with media. Media has been desensitizing people for years and years and years. You Do you know, think it's intentional? I think part of it is, yeah. I believe that we have spiritual forces that are working daily um, to keep the general public doubtful of their existence or you know, one of the things that, that you'll do in a warfare is you'll try and make your enemy think you don't exist. Mm -hmm. You know, that way you can run right. ripshot Great over defense. him and he'll never, Great you know, defense. he'll never take up arms against you. And so um, Christians for a long time in media have been played as, you know, you always see Christians in movies standing up to the dragon and, and mm -hmm. you know, spiritual people using spiritual powers of good and they always end up, you know, getting chewed up and spit out. You have the, meanwhile, you have the witch, you know, mm -hmm. trying to do good things with bad magic and they're coming out on top. Or you'll see all of this gore displayed as far as the occult and it's so portrayed in such an extravagant manner that people believe that's all it is, is extravagance rather than realizing all of that is based in reality. Well, why do they sacrifice a child in uh, Satanism? Satanism is predominantly based in um, old law what you would call Old Testament law. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Um, goes back to the original sin of man, which caused an animal to have to die for God to make skins to clothe, mm -hmm. you know, man, because he fell. Uh, sin has always led to the shedding of blood, and therefore the shedding of blood has always been a way of paying for sin, okay? But also there's life in the blood. And, you know, every pagan religion in the world requires some kind of sacrifice. Some kind, whether it's animal, grain, person, you know? It's like what you give up for your God, it's all based in works, there's no grace. Okay, Lisa, how did you feel when you saw a life being taken? The first time, terrified. I blocked it out for years and years. Didn't recall it for a long time. Uh, eventually, you get hardened to it you realize that what you're doing is you have a need to achieve a certain power or a certain goal. And if one person suffers because of that, that's the cost. And why, why did you have a cost. need to achieve a certain power or a certain goal? Why did you have a need? By that time, my whole identity came from what people told me I was and who people told me I was. My abilities. Uh, once you get involved in the kingdom of darkness, it's like a dog-eat-dog -dog mentality, gunslinger mentality. And so you progress, you know, from power to power to power, and there's always somebody trying to knock you out. But your whole identity is consumed with what you can achieve and how much power you can get for yourself and control What, over what did others. you think would happen when you died? I believed that I would go to be with my master in the kingdom of darkness and would be given a position of rulership there. But certainly you heard about Jesus. Jesus, to me, was um, a man who was stupid enough to find himself nailed to a cross. He was a good man, okay? Uh, he had a message from God, but unless people took advantage of his message, then they had no authority to stop you. And if they chose not to learn how to stop me, then they didn't have a right to, take, to keep anything I wanted to take from them. Okay, a time came when they wanted you to have a child so that they could sacrifice it or, or use it in some way. Why in the world did you find this distasteful? It's different when it's yours, you know? Uh, that's an ultimate thing. By the time they asked for that, 
I had had two major experiences in my life that had started me on a, an adventure of questioning everything that I had been taught for 20 years. Uh, all of the, the spiritual laws and principles that I had been taught that gave me the right, the legal rights, to use and manipulate and control powers of darkness, I was beginning to question because I had two encounters that were not supposed to have been able to happen. Like what? Uh, the first was um, I was moved to another state. And that's often done. They'll position people in different states because they view it territorially. They want to mm -hmm. you know, maintain control in certain areas. So I was moved to this one state, and one of um, my assignments was to tear apart or destroy uh, the ministry of this one man who had started teaching on spiritual well, warfare. Why, why would you care about, if Jesus didn't exist, what difference does it make if you tear a minister apart or not? What's the big deal? Because this minister believed in everything that Jesus did, and he was standing on spiritual laws that were superior to ours. For example, you know, a person could die a pauper if they never knew they had a million dollars in the bank. Most Christians believe they have a million dollars in the bank. They just never go withdraw it. Okay, so this man was making trouble for your kingdom. Right. What was the objective? What did you want to do to this man, this minister? We wanted to get him out of ministry. However, that we had to do that. And if we couldn't do that, destroy him, kill him. Um, had you or your friends done this with other ministers previously? Mm -hmm. Yes. I will tell yeah. you at the specific time that I was sent to this one city, we had five other people positioned. One was in a major city where a major ministry fell as a result of that. Yeah, how, how do you try to, do, uh, to cause a minister to fall? You look for weaknesses, for vices that you can manipulate, um, any sin, loophole, area, impropriety. You find his greatest source of, source of counsel in unity you know, if he has a, a partner uh, for a church, for example, you would look at the pastor and associate pastor, or the pastor and the music leader. You know, find the, the strongest source of unity and you divide it. Divide and conquer. Okay, what happened when you went into this particular church? I went in, I kept sending people in first, you know, to go in, in what we called infiltrators. Mm -hmm. And they weren't coming back. Um, <laughs> some of them... <laughs> were just not getting anywhere and were just too embarrassed to come back and admit failure because that's, you know, that's a no-no. I mean, you just don't admit failure or weakness. So you now, at the level you're at, you're going to go in and take care of business, right? Right, because I had people mm -hmm. above me that were sitting on me going, why aren't you getting this done? Okay, so here I go in to handle it myself. Under I'll tell you what, when Lisa comes back, we're going to find out how she took care of this minister. Don't you dare go away. We will return to It's Supernatural right after this. Hello, I'm Sid Roth, your investigative reporter. I imagine you didn't even run to the refrigerator to get some food <laughs> during, during the uh, break because my guest was a high priestess of Satan and her job was to go into churches and cause the, the pastors or the leadership to fall and just because the power in this one particular church was hurting her kingdom and she had sent other people there to disrupt their church and it hadn't been successful. So Lisa Gwynn, you, uh, you decided you're going to take care of it. What happened? Well, I went in under the guise of, of wanting help from this pastor who was, was doing so much counseling and, and helping mm -hmm. people with occult pasts. And, uh, and my encounter with him was really shook the foundation of everything that I had been taught. I, I was taught that I, I served the ultimate power. Well, you know, five minutes after I walked through the door, uh, he began to pray to his God. And what that did to me was, was really wreak havoc. And uh, it caused all of the demonic powers that I thought I had in control to pretty much um, come out, uh, manifest themselves. You know, the room began to fill up when he prayed. And really they began to threaten me because I had taken them into a situation against a power that they couldn't stand against. And I, after that point, I began to question everything I'd been taught in Satanism about the power of darkness because I had been taught that I served the supreme ruler in darkness, the supreme power. Uh, listen, if, sudden, they're, if they're afraid of this Christian minister mm -hmm. while you're alive, 
then how about the repercussion of what happens when you die? I mean, you, you thought you were assuring yourself a kingdom with Satan, but right. he can't even handle things in this life. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Um, Satan's pretty much just a, a spoiled brat who knows his time is near, and he's pulling out all the stops to keep his little sandcastle kingdom from being washed away. Well, so you know? did this minister tell you to accept Jesus, and did you? Uh, he did, but I didn't. Why? Um, everything that I knew about Jesus was no power, okay? All the churches I had ever been in, uh, and a lot of the Christians I had known, just were wimps. You know, they said God was all powerful, but they were always going through all these circumstances. They had no power yeah, in yeah, their no, life. No, no, no. But at this particular one, there was obviously power. So why didn't you accept Jesus? There's another factor involved in that. What's that? After a while, you are so used to the kingdom of darkness, you believe you are of the kingdom of darkness, and you can't change. Hmm. It's like holding out, you know... Um, it's like a homosexual that thinks he can't change. Yeah, thinks he's chained, that there's no other option. Yeah. But there quickly be caring of an apparent option. You know, the Lord began to just put miraculous circumstances in my life. God began to orchestrate people that came into my life. Oh, well, there that was a person that up. came into your life. You, you were instructed to have a child for the sake of uh, sacrifice, mm -hmm. and uh, you rebelled. You didn't, you didn't want to do that. Right. Uh, and, and so you ran. Yeah. Weren't you afraid? Yeah, I was, but I knew when I made the choices that I made, I knew that if I ever decided to leave, they would come and kill me, and I accepted the consequences of that. And they sent an infiltrator. Tell me about him. Well, I, I kind of fell in love with this guy that I thought was the cat's meow. You know, he was everything mm -hmm. I ever wanted. Um, and after six months of living together, I discovered that he too was a high priest that had been sent just to keep tabs on my life. Um, confronted him with that knowledge, managed to separate myself from him, and shortly thereafter found out that I was pregnant. And oh. he made it real clear, being a high priest, he said, now, he said, that's my ticket. That child's my ticket. And faced with that option, abortion became my option. Uh, which he didn't take lying down. You don't mm -hmm. do that. You don't, the, you don't abort the, the child of a high priest. Um, and so he uh, pretty much broke into my apartment the next day with some of his friends, destroyed just about everything in it, and beat me so badly I was told I could never have children. Uh, and at that point I ran. I ran out to the West Coast. I buried myself working for the motion picture studios, um, just trying to hide. And, uh, but you had a grandmother that didn't give up on you, that knew right. how to get in touch with God, and one day she called you. Yeah, she would call me all the time uh, through the years. You know, I would be in the midst of sin and hear the answering machine come on, and I'd hear her say, Day, Lord, have mercy, child. I don't know what you've been doing, but I've been talking to God, and He told me to call you and tell you to stop. You know, and I'd well, when always she be said those things, timing. When she said those things, what did you think? I used to think, man, Grandma's just... She's got it all together. You know, she really, she knows about spiritual power. I never thought about the source of that spiritual power, you know. Um, but when she called and told me, she says, I don't need to know everything you've been involved in, don't want to, but you need to find a man who believes in the power of God, a preacher or somebody, tell them what you've been involved in and ask for help. And I did and got no results. Uh, Why? Well, the first church I went to, the pastor got kind of scared and said, you know, we don't want any trouble here, and showed me to the door. Um, because a lot of churches, although they affirm the power of God, they deny that there is a, a devil. They, they take half of the Bible and believe it and throw out the other half. Um, the other pastor uh, didn't believe a word I said. Uh, still another one told me, well, what you have to do is you have to pray every day and go to church every week and read your Bible every day. And he was giving me all these step-by-step -step things to do. And I looked at him, I said, that sounds like ritual to me. And if I'm not mistaken, it's ritual that got me in this condition. And so I gave up. But fortunately, you saw someone on television. Yeah, I did. I started watching this uh, minister on television, and, and he had a rather miraculous, powerful television show. And I found out he was going to be in the area, and I decided that I would go and check him out and see if what I was seeing on TV was true. And? Uh, the last meeting, I started to leave, and through just a series of events and people, uh, chose to stay, and he opened his sermon that night, was saying, I don't know if you've ever had the devil visit you in your home, and he began to share in, a, in an encounter that he had had with a demonic presence, and he had my attention. 
and I listened to what he said. He began to pray afterwards and called out miracles and, and healings and things, and he said, if you felt the power of God, get down here. Well, I didn't feel anything, but this person next to me pushed me out into the aisle, and I was kind of caught in the flow because obviously hundreds of other people had felt something, mm -hmm. and they were all crammed in the aisle, and I was like, I had no choice. Right. <laughs> so I um, ended up getting up onto the, the stage, and he prayed for me, and nothing happened. Absolutely nothing happened. And I walked off the stage, and here this teenager again that had pushed me out in the aisle to begin with came up and said, get back in line. You know, you came here for something, don't leave without it. And I, I told him, I said, no, I, I know where the line is. I crossed it, the point of no return, and I can live with that. But on my way out the door, here came this teenage boy again with his pastor, towing him toward me saying, help me pray for this girl. And that pastor confronted me with a question. He said, what do you want? If God or Jesus were standing here and asked you what you wanted, what would you tell him? And I began with my list. You know, I wanted to know what peace of mind was, what it was like to say the world, word beautiful again, what it was like to sleep more than two or three hours a night without things moving in my room or voices. I wanted to know what peace was. And as I gave him my list, I noticed that my face was wet and I reached up and wiped these tears away. And I guess the shock really showed because this preacher said what? And I, all I could stutter was, I didn't think they worked anymore. Why? I realized I was crying. I had said, Years before, um, when I, the last time I had cried, I said I would never shed another tear when I was eight years old because I was falsely accused of something. And it so wounded me. And the person that accused me said, see, she's guilty because she's crying. If she wasn't guilty, she wouldn't be crying. And I viewed tears as something so horrible. But through those tears, he asked me, he said, if God could give you those things, would you give him a chance? And I said, certainly. I struck a deal with the devil once. I can certainly do the same thing for God and give him a try. And he led me in a prayer, acknowledging I was a sinner and asking the Lord to forgive me. And that began the change in my life. Everything from the next couple of days. What, just what being, happened that night when you went home? Oh, I started driving from San Jose down to Los Angeles. And the more I drove, the drunker I got. I mean, I was getting queasy. I hadn't had anything to drink, alcohol, but I felt drunk. And um, I remember stopping to get gas, and I was washing my hands in the bathroom, and I started laughing, you know, just laughing. And I was so drunk and laughing so hard, I ended up throwing my wallet to the but cashier. But you, you didn't drink any no. alcohol. No. All I can say is God was doing spiritual surgery on me, and the laughter was an anesthetic. He was using laughter. You know, the Bible says that laughter works good like a medicine. Yes. He was using that laughter to do a lot of healing inside of me because I had gotten into Satanism from woundedness, you know? And you can't just quit something when you don't get rid of the cause. You know, you can treat the symptom, but if you don't get to the wound, you're just going to substitute another symptom, you know? So the Lord used that and He began to do surgery on me. And for a couple of days, I was just drunk. When I made it home, I went to sleep at 11.30 in the morning, hadn't slept for mm -hmm. two days went to sleep at 11.30 in the morning, had never slept more than an hour or two a night. I woke up 9.30 the next morning, 22 hours later, in the same position I went to sleep in. How'd you feel? Still drunk. <laughs> <laughs> and it's been nothing but a change ever since, a great adventure of watching the Lord take me from step of freedom to step of freedom. Yeah, yes, but you don't leave as a high priestess of Satan and just say, bye-bye, guys. I'm no. now a believer in Jesus. I understand the daughter uh, of one of the top priests, or the top priest in the world of Satan, uh, came after you. Tell me about that. Yeah, they sent um, enforcers, which are people that will either kill you or take you back, uh, to kill me. Three enforcers. I found myself out in the desert, and I told them, in the name of Jesus, you have to let me go. Um, they did. I should have told them, in the name of Jesus, you can't touch me, because I was pretty much a little bit worse for wear when they did let me go. But the Lord delivered me out of that situation. And, um, you know, and later I asked the Lord, why, how did they do that? Because I knew these men who didn't kill me were going to be killed for not fulfilling their assignment. Mm -hmm. And the Lord took me into the book of Romans where it says that if we've, you know, been buried with Christ in baptism, if we've entered into the family of God, then we've been buried with him into his death. And that the old me, the only one they had a license to kill was the old me. She's the one who did all of those things. And when I accepted the Lord, I became a new creation. And as long as I keep the old me dead, he will keep the new me alive. That's how I walked away. The devil's got power. You know that. 
Yes. Are you telling me that he's got nothing compared to the power of God? Nothing. He has counterfeits wrapped up in pretty packages that he's been using from the beginning of time to fool people into thinking that he's got the ultimate power so that folks will never know that there is not just an ultimate power in God, but part of that power is the strength of love that God has for people. If you do not know God, you don't know love. Yeah. If you do not know acceptance, you have no way of coping what's, with what's going on in this world. To know God is to know love. To know God is to know the Jewish Messiah, Jesus. When you repent of your sins and you turn from them and you say, I believe Jesus died for my sins, you are washed clean and God will live inside of you and God will give you a peace like what you're experiencing right now. Some of you are experiencing the peace of God right now. As soon as we're through, you do business with the living God.